out the lightest light. <laughs> Speaking of bright lights, one thing I learned growing up in Saudi Arabia is that it's hot, very hot. Our average temperature goes up to around 45 degrees Celsius. And if you're ever outside wearing shorts, you can legitimately feel your skin cooking. But something strange has been happening these past few winters in the northern regions. We're seeing snow. I personally have never seen snow, having lived most of my life in the Middle East, except for the fake kind, of course. But now to have a region infamous for its hot climate, blanketed in a blizzard, is, to say the least, weird. Now you must be wondering, how or why is this happening? The answer to that is global warming, climate change. Should have seen that coming. <laughs> the increase in temperatures are distorting the Earth's water cycle, making it snow, even in the hottest parts of the planet. It's the cost to forest fires becoming more wilder and floods more treacherous. From the fires in Malibu to Hurricane Harvey. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, our planet has been changing drastically. As economies thrive, they require capital and resources, and all of that comes at a cost. As the population rises, the expansion of cities requires forests to be leveled, and the same goes for agriculture. Travel and trade requires transport in the form of cars, ships, and trains, which all are powered by fossil fuels. Our entire existence is dependent on the Earth. It is very clear to us that the damage done to our planet is our own doing. And we need to act. And if not now, when? But if human civilization is so dependent on the Earth, how can it become sustainable? The answer to that may lie in mindful use. Which brings me to this image. This is an image of Jakarta, a satellite's imaging camera. And Jakarta is sinking. The overuse of groundwater is causing the topography to change. And it's sinking fast. At 10 inches per year, 40% of the city is already underwater. And it's images like these that are helping us track that rate. This is an image of the Amazonian wildfires. The wildfires have seen an increase of a whopping 83% compared to last year. And the cloudy overlay you see in this image aren't just clouds, but it's smoke being carried across the entire continent. As climate tragedies increase in intensity and occurrence, in-depth imagery offers us an opportunity. Now, we're no strangers to satellite imagery. It's powering modern life. How many of you got here using Google Maps? I know I did, and I live down the road. But what if we could use this imagery to track the changes in our, on our planet and correlate that with the changes in our climate? What if we could use this imagery to discourage overuse of our natural resources while increasing efficiency? Those are the questions my team is trying to answer. How can we use satellites to help our planet and its people at scale? Now, if I ask you to picture a satellite in your head right now, you might think of a behemoth of a machine, orbiting the planet, collecting all sorts of data, probably needing a warehouse like this to be assembled. But satellites have now changed. Just as computers used to take up a whole room, but now fit in your pocket, satellites can now fit in your palm which is why we've developed Climate Cube 1. Climate Cube 1 is a CubeSat, a satellite that barely weighs around a kilogram and is, well, a cube. 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters in size, but can also weigh to 30 centimeters in length. This small package can do exactly what those behemoths can. What you see me holding is one of our early prototypes, fitting easily in the palm of my hand. And now, Let me introduce you to its little brother. <laughs> Sorry, the timing was a little off. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Other than the pretty lights, it's a fully functioning flight computer, sending data of its orientation, location, and velocity to the cloud as I speak while also changing its internal disco ball light, uh, lights to accordingly to its orientation, running a, con running a prototype for our control software. You may ask, how can something so small be better than something so big? The problem with bigger satellites is that they're either very localized or do not tell you the whole story. They have helped us understand our planet a lot, but there's more to it than what meets the eye. 
I'll just keep you down here, little buddy. As I said, there's more to it than what meets the eye, which is why Climate Cube 1 will be capable of multispectral imagery, an imaging technique that not only looks at the visible spectrum of light, but light and wavelengths we cannot see. The human eye can only see three colors, red, blue, and green. Everything else is a mix of it. But light, which is essentially a form of radiation, goes further into a range which we cannot see. For this, we're developing special imaging systems to capture light in spectrums which a normal camera cannot. Now this data can help us tell, can tell us more about the surface temperature of the Earth, the composition of gases in the atmosphere helping us track greenhouse emissions, and as every element reflects light in a different way, a multispectral image taken from space can tell you about the material compositions beneath the Earth's surface. Imagine having data of every ore of mineral on Earth under the surface, of the, un, under the surface to every speck of plastic in the ocean. It's called Climate Cube 1 because it's the first of many. We want to launch a whole constellation orbiting the planet, collecting data for our forests, oceans, and cities alike. And we do not only want to collect this data, but to act upon it. We want to supply industries with this data to help them be more efficient in the use of the Earth's resources, putting them in a position to profit while still being sustainable. With the growing obsession over the second space race, pulling off a project like this is not only feasible, but a necessity. Getting to space has not been as easy as it is now. Space is no longer an endeavor, disconnect, a disconnected endeavor affecting only a small few. It now has the capability to change all of our lives, whether we're the ones going to Mars or not. The data collected by Climate Cube 1 when it's launched in 2021 will be open sourced, available to all to learn and to act. We want the world to use our data to make smart decisions, not just educated guesses. And we're not waiting till 2021 to make a change. Soon, we will be releasing an open software tool comprised of data collected by NASA and the ESA to serve as a basis for the data Climate Q1 will collect. This data can help us give estimates of what each of our activities are doing to change the climate and to help us mitigate those risks to still be a civilization dependent on the Earth while still being sustainable. Industries like mining can benefit from this, forecasting what an excavation would do to an ecosystem while increasing efficiency can drastically decrease the environmental impact. And the same goes for oil and, the ga oil and gas industries. Switching to green energy overnight is impossible. But we can move towards a greener future. We can improve these industries to move towards a greener future. And it's not just the big wigs who can benef benefit from this. Our data will be available to researchers and to students. We want to create a platform for everyone to build innovative solutions to help save our planet. Therefore, I'd like to ask you, what would you use this data for? What will you make better? Because nothing will change unless we do. Thank you.